Hello, Jan Blake. Hey, Simon, how you doing? I am well, I'm well. Sun's shining, we've got a garden, we're, we're okay. How are you? Good. Yeah, I'm good, actually. I think I can quite safely say that it's been a very, very, very long time since I felt this okay. You know, the, uh, the times have their benefits. Say again? The times have their benefits. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. My dad uh, said that he's about 70. Yeah. yeah. I haven't told anyone, but I'm very much enjoying my isolation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have to. He doesn't have to, you know, say yes to social invitations and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So, in my case, it's I don't have to go to another airport, another train station. I don't have to book another Uber. I have to negotiate whether or not I want to take the tube, which I never do. Yeah. You know, uh, calculate whether or not I should be taking the train immediately after peak time or give myself a couple of hours so that it's not so cr crushed on the train. There's all these things that start to impact on you, you know, that you don't realize are impacting on you. Yeah. And then you're just taken away. Boom. Yeah. You don't have to worry, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Taken back to my, my garden. To your garden. So, um, thanks very much for having a chat today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, what I what I was just uh, I was just telling you just now, um, I started wondering aloud to myself. Uh, I noticed a lot of disorientation, um, and also a lot of people using this time to ask really deep questions about kind of their life. And I thought there's some people who I'd like to talk about this with, and um, and uh, one of them was you. Cool, and, I'm honoured, thank you. Yeah, so I just, I kind of um, should say how we know each other. Well, I know you, of course, because of your storytelling, as a preeminent storyteller, uh, raconteurs, as you say. Yeah, I've dropped that, actually. I've stopped saying that now. Raconteurs. Oh, yeah, it's, it's gone. Grabbed. Yeah, take it, it's yours. <laughs> yeah, I'll take it, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then uh, I was incredibly fortunate to do your course, the, the Body of Words course. Mm. Um, and I think like the big things I got from that were about being ready and just being ultra responsive to whatever, whatever's happening now. Mm. Yeah. And and also, it's almost your first starter for like your precondition for storytelling is joy. Yeah, like, absolutely. You get a room singing, you'll get us, you know, before we've even met each other, we'll all be singing together. Yeah. Do you think That's that, true. does that sort of inform, does that help you out when something like this hits? Joy? Mm. Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, for me, I mean, just to kind of give you a, a, a the reason why I get everyone to sing together is because I think that the places that we tell stories in now are kind of contrived situations. You know, storytelling originally happened within communities who knew each other, you know, knew the, the land that they were telling in, knew the stories of the land that they were sitting on, et cetera, et cetera. And we've moved so far away from that that the only way for me anyway to kind of try and create this sense of community is, is to have everyone have everyone lift their voices in song together mm. you know and when you sing with the person beside you or the person in front of you or the person behind you um you lift your voices together and you blend your voices and you create beautiful harmonies together you are one yeah. and for the time that we're in the theater or whatever the space is that we're telling your this uh, sense of we as opposed to me 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 is created and that's what i um that's what i think is most important for the environment for telling mm. and for now where i'm now the the joy of life itself is a must i think mm. i think it's easy 
to, there's lots to question about what's going on. There's lots to be worried about. There's lots to be scared about. There's lots to mistrust, you know, but despite all of that, you know, whatever obstacles are flung in our way because of the situation we're in, for me, it's important to dig deep and find joy in things that perhaps, I don't know, a year ago I would have considered a chore, you know, like the garden, for instance. Not that I've done much of it. My sister's Speedy Gonzalez on that. So she's kind of gone through the garden. You know, I had to say to her the other day, you know, slow down because you don't know how long the lockdown you can have. You can <laughs> have so much garden, all, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can have used up all your chores and then what are you going to do? Do you know what I mean? But just being in the garden the other day and turning over the soil. Yeah. And that for me would have been, I've, I've got to get this done. I haven't got time to do it. And then I'm, because I might have to go off and do this, that, the other. But just to turn the soil over, you know, dig out the weeds and just the time that I spent just taking the soil off the roots of the weeds. Do you know what I mean? Just the time that I allowed myself to do that. It's not something that I don't, it's like everything's gone into slow motion almost mm. for me yeah. and um to enjoy the slow motion of it all yeah. has been really really good you know getting on my bike in the morning and just cycling through the and when i first started you know my sister's a personal trainer so we were, were cycling together but for her it's like go 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 and i'm just like no 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 so <laughs> so we decided to, to not cycle together anymore, but I still go out on the bike every morning and I take my camera. And at first I was treating it as exercise. And then I was like, well, there's times when I want to stop and take a photo of that tree. I want to take a photo of that flower, you know, or catch the photo of that squirrel in that tree. So I still do the exercise, but I allow myself to slow the whole process down. There's no, I don't feel a hand pushing me along in my back. And I think I felt like that for a long time so taking the slowing everything down slowing myself down and extracting as much joy out of each moment of my day has just been wondrous life-giving yeah it is it really is because mm. i heard i mean it, not I, I i'm sort of aware that not everyone's in that space like I, i'm a kind of when i see people are sort of have chats with people some people are just like what an opportunity you know i've got yeah. the space and i can reach out to people it's a time for community um and other people are like panicking they're like i yeah. don't know how to deal with all this shit coming my way yeah i remember once you said that you just like you just never felt fear or like you just got taught from an early age to be Fear. Well, not to, not to fear death. Not to fear death. That's what I was, yeah, that specifically. And I think that's what's fueling a lot of the freaking out at the moment. And I was taught from an early age that death is inevitable. So whatever form it comes in, it's still death. You know, it's still going to happen. You cannot avoid your own death. So, you know, when I was a kid, my mum used to sing a song to us. Can I sing it to you? Oh, I'd love to hear it. It's, it's a very simple get, little song. It's a I very want to simple. Give it to my son, I want to. <laughs> I want to, <laughs> but in a bit when he's ready. But yeah, yeah, go so, for it. Is, is for as long as I can remember, it's a very simple song, and it goes, "We're all going to pass one day. Mother's going to pass. Father's going to pass. We're all going to pass one day. We're all going to pass one day." Brother's going to pass, sister's going to pass, we're all going to pass one day. Don't cry, don't cry. No, but when, when would your, how old, how old were you? Uh, as early as I can remember, my mum singing that song. And what was it like to hear that song? Freaky. <laughs> it, used to fr it used to frighten me right. because I didn't want to die. You know, when you're a kid, you don't want to think about dying but they were insistent. My mom never once said, if I said to my mom, see you tomorrow, she'd say, if life's spare, which means if your life is spared. That was a constant, that was, that was the response. Wow. 
So it was that tomorrow's not promised. And it wasn't heavy. It wasn't like, oh, you're going to die. It wasn't like that. It was just, that's the way it is. That's just the way it is, you know. You might not see me tomorrow. I might not see you tomorrow. Yeah. So, yeah. There's a, cause there's when you in lullaby, the... I think that is, was more present in the past. There was a lullaby. That, like it goes lullaby and good night with roses delight la 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 and then the end it it goes if god will thou shalt wake when the morning sh doth break if god will thou shalt wake when the morning doth break right yeah and that's like i started singing that to my son and i was like if god will that shall break i was like <laughs> you know there's a <laughs> you might not make it through the night you know yeah. like, <laughs> but your mum yeah. like embraced that and sort of imbued that in you early on yeah but i don't think it was just my mom i think it was it's part of jamaican culture you know it's just there it's it's just part you just know that right you know so so the the climate and the way things are at the moment first of all i've accepted a long time ago that i can't control everything i can only risk control my response to things one and two that there's no point in fear in death because death's coming maybe not tomorrow but it's on its way but maybe tomorrow who knows i don't know mm. i just know it's inevitable mm. so therefore to freak out about covid19 is counterintuitive to me yeah to freak out about the way it's been spun or the way other people are behaving or the kind of um like when the panic buying started that that's what i freak out about that human yeah. beings have lost their minds what is it but it's because they're afraid of death that's actually. the core that's yeah because um interesting i was talking to my friend godfrey who grew up in sudan mm. and i said do you look at us and just feel more ready Mm. And, and he said, Simon, he just <laughs> took a long, deep breath, said, Simon, I grew up. The game I played as a kid was working out what type of rifle was firing when I heard a gunshot. And my friends right. and I would know the rifle or what kind of aircraft's coming in to drop yeah. a bomb on a nearby village. And he said, yeah. you know, he says, I feel like uh, this is all a gift because I should have been gone. He said, right. I should have been already taken. I'm going to sneeze. Hold on. No, I'm not going to sneeze. I probably will later. Sorry to interrupt you. No, it's all good. All good. Yeah, so there's something about that um, facing that realization. So you're the second person I've chatted to in a few days. <laughs> there, <you are. laughs> there we go. Yeah. Go ahead. You were saying. Yeah, it, it just. It's almost like there is a bottom to that realization. You can just take that on board. It doesn't have to be this endless weight that's on your back. Yeah. That you're going to go. You're just like, oh, yeah, that is it. It's just part of it. It's just part of it. And if you can accept that it's part of it, the manner of one's going may be more challenging than accepting that one has to go. I think that's what people are freaking out. Everybody wants to die. And everyone wants to get grow old and die peacefully in their beds. I think that's deeply held in most people and uh, the the virus outbreak or the pandemic the whatever this is um has shaken people to their core because mm -hmm. they can't avoid it you have to look at it now something that i think people sweep under the carpet a lot of the time you know and and i think that this and I don't mean this in a morbid way, you know, I just mean that it's just part of, it's part of it, you know, and it's, it's time to have a good look at it and it's okay and, and come to peace with it, and get good with it and let it be okay. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that that's the same with the worries about money as well? Like you would, yeah. I think, I think those of us who, you know, have, uh, they're living uh, consistently, steadily. It's the unsure, you know, it's being unsure of what's around the corner. If you've got family, if, you've, if you're up to your neck in 
credit cards, if you've got a mortgage to pay, you know, all of these things, they're very real things. And I think that the uncertainty that comes along with not being able to manage your finances or not being able to pay your debts or um, there's a lot of pressure. And I think the pressure is, it's not just coming from inside. I think the pressure it's coming from outside as well. You know, we're supposed to be, despite the fact that the rug's been pulled out from under everyone, this idea that we've still got to press ahead and be successful despite the time. Mm. We've got to press ahead and market, market, market ourselves. You know, we've got to reconfigure and remarket ourselves. And maybe the times don't call for that. But it's very real. You know, you want to be able to put food in your in your belly, in the belly of your family, you know, you want to be able to keep your roof over your head. They're real things. Mm. And I don't poo-poo that in any, I, I, I don't know. I can't say, because I don't feel it's my place to say, I think people have real, real concerns about their future and the safety and protection of their families. That's, that's an eternal and universal feeling. I don't think the times um, have anything to do with that. Yeah. I just think that there's a, a different level of pressure on it. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, like, seeing people, because a lot of people are kind of uh, embracing this as a massive opportunity. Mm. So uh, a few people sent me questions when I said I'm going to be talking to some storytellers. And, um, <clears throat> and they were like, okay, we've all seen, you know, the economy's just gone out the picture. Mm. And we've had a, a window into what it is like to lead a non-economically defined life. You know, what is it? People, like you say, you're sort of, you're enjoying your garden. You're enjoying, yeah. you know, that urgency's gone. And then what do we find ourselves doing? I mean, I've just, um, I was just uh, sanding apple crates in our garden. And we're yeah. going to build a shed out of apple crates. Well, right. Lara, my son, is running around building like mud and weed soup. You know, yeah. and the thing was just like perfect. You know, thank you, COVID nineteen. Wouldn't have, <laughs> wouldn't have done this otherwise. You know. Yeah. And um, there's a lovely uh, someone I've known for a while now called Alicia Lee, mm -hmm. and she said, "How are we going to?" keep these these things we're finding out about ourselves and our lives on a personal level or but also but kind of on a systemic level how are we going to make sure we keep doing them maybe you know the 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 shutter comes down and we just snip back into the old habits i don't think it's possible to snip back into the old habits i think i think that people you know there's a lot invested in you know going back to the old habits um, but I don't think it's going to be, if it happens, it won't happen like that. It'll be a gradual thing. I don't think it'll happen like that. But I do believe that as a storyteller, well, in my case anyway, that I, I don't know anything about economics. I'm very bad with money. I'm very bad with organising money. I'm very bad at thinking about how to organise money. I'm good at earning it, but the rest I know nothing about. So from my point of view, I'm just, like I said, I, kind of, I feel like I've gone into slow motion. So my work has moved onto an online platform, um, which means that I can, I can keep doing what I'm doing because what I'm doing now, because I don't have to get on a plane. I don't have to get on a train. I don't have to get in a taxi. I don't have to do anything like that. Are you I don't have, sorry? Are you doing online gigs? I've just kind of created a project for an organization here in, uh, in the Northwest in Macclesfield, an online um, community project, family project. Uh, I am a freelance trainer for UNHCR mm. and I was supposed to be traveling with them. That's not going to happen. So we've moved it onto an online platform. Right. Um, and I've just done a storytelling 
for um, uh, Festival International Montreal, recorded the story for that. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of, I'm not pursuing any work. I'm not pursuing work. I've never pursued work. I've never been good at marketing. I've never been good at any of that stuff. Yeah. I just, you know, someone says, will you come and do this gig? I say, yeah, okay. Or no, I don't think I can do that. That's it. <laughs> so because I, I don't, love not... that. You know what? I want to, I want to go into that a bit more because I was like, uh, you said that to me a few years ago when I was in your mm. course, you're like, I just sit on my sofa and wait for the phone to ring and you've never gone out. You've never cold called. You never put yourself. No, I can't never... bear it. I cannot bear it. No. It feels like I'm being forced to be part of something that I, I'm, I'm not comfortable with when I do that. If I had to do that, I should say. I'm not comfortable with that. I'm not comfortable with it. I'm comfortable with sending out the vibe of what I need and trusting that it will come. I'm comfortable with that. And I've never been, I've never been steered wrong with that. That is phenomenal what you're saying. That's really phenomenal. It's never, it's honestly, I'm not lying. From the day Ben Haggerty said to me, you are a storyteller, you have to do that for the rest of your life. I've said, okay. And anything that has come across my door that I want to do, I've said, okay. And I've just said, okay, okay, okay. Or no, that doesn't feel right. Yeah. And it's all to do with what I feel. So, Obviously, people have seen my work and people have gone, we have to book that storyteller and they contact me and say, will you come and do this? And I say, OK, you know, and I love it, you know, and I made a, uh, a long time ago. Um, I made a pledge to myself that I would go to as many countries in the world as I could and tell stories in those countries. That was just a pledge to myself. I didn't do anything to make that happen, but it has happened. I also need to put in as a disclaimer that I am one of the laziest people <laughs> you will ever meet when it comes to, the, you know, marketing. It's just like, oh, bloody hell. No. Can't be no, but There's something in it. I mean, I should say, like, I mean, not just for the people at home. I love to say it. But for the, if anyone's watching, if anyone's watching, um, like, I mean, you're a phenomenal storyteller. I mean, it's not like anyone could just go, do you know what? I'm not only a phenomenal storyteller, but it's that letting go. And I want to mirror that with my own experience because I did the opposite of what you did. You know? Right. I was like, build it and they will come. So I was like, if I want to be a storyteller, I've got to put on the space for people to find out about me. Mm. and um and i wanted to because also i wanted to for me that was the art like creating the space was the art how can i host um a a community of appreciation for the depth that stories hold and in amsterdam at that time i didn't see that happening to the extent right. what i wanted to bring forward wasn't occurring so it's sort of gone in cycles there have been things that have been created and faded away created faded away created faded away and then at one point I started to get in a panic about like, you know, I'm 36 and uh, I've been a storyteller for like seven years now and the stuff that I want to happen isn't going to happen. And I just blasted it for six months. I just went crazy, you know, right. um, started to write the book. I felt that I should be writing, um, you know, putting on the um, uh, moving, not just in storytelling as in let's, here's a story I'd like to tell you, but let's walk through kind of your life in a weekend using myth and story, which I just, yeah. I love anyway. And the interesting thing was that the, the more effort I was putting in, the more I drove at it. Yeah. You know, some things were happening, but not enough. And so I, I got to a point where I just said, uh, you know, I'm taking my hands off the handlebar and I don't know after this, if I'm going to be a storyteller. Got right. to the end, of, the end of the year. This has just happened. Uh, right. I got to the end of last year and I said uh, and there was one more gig I had to do because I kept all my commitments and I told yeah. the story 
it's like my favorite story Leila Majnou yes and I knew inside after that I was like I'm a bloody storyteller I just <laughs> I am that's not going to leave me yeah but then I stopped I didn't start went on to create something I was like, I'm just going to see and you know three years after you said it to me I was like I actually did just take off the the you know the guide from the tiller mm. and weirdly the invitations that have come my way since then have been richer they've been fruitier like than anything if I'd written a list down of this is what I want to do I couldn't have done it you know there are um like refugee spaces in Amsterdam Utrecht and we're gonna like learn folk tales together like we're gonna right. like, carry your story ask the question of like what is um how are you going to pass your culture on to your grandchildren that's what we're going to ask mm. like let's get a, get not a lot of stories but one story you can walk with and you can tell them and they can feel they can get the texture of your life that you've left mm. um, yeah get that like so like stories can say it serve that sense of homing you know? mm. and i didn't okay. come up with that someone had to ask me yeah I had to come my way yeah, yeah. so i'm applying it if, like it seems to be working what you're saying i've experienced <laughs> the other thing yeah like the trying to make it happen and now i've just sunk into well what will be will be it's been it's it's rich yeah, it's really rich and i think i think also the 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 need we've all been fed i think this idea that that we need to be successful and we need to work at it, you know, but it just doesn't, it just doesn't sit. It doesn't make sense to me. You know, there's a lot around storytelling and about storytelling that doesn't make sense to me. So I just don't engage with it. You know, I don't criticize others for what they do, but I just, you, what, just what do you mean? What, like, what could you well, give for me instance, to? one of the things I, I'm, in response to what's going on now, for instance, the, the time we're living through. Um, and, you know, hats off, bless every single person who felt moved to put up a, a video or to make some comment through story about the times that we're living in. You know, who am I to judge them? And I don't. But I don't feel especially qualified to respond to these times just because I'm a storyteller. Right. I don't think that I, Jan Blake, have to kind of dive into some sense of self-appointed wisdom because I call myself a storyteller or because I am a storyteller. You can have a, you know, I said this the, the other day, you know, I was speaking for a podcast and I was saying, you know, an electrician can be wise, uh, a cleaner can be wise, and you know, a, a cook can be wise. A mechanic can be wise, you know, they can, you can just be a wise person. But the idea that because you engage in the act of telling stories that you are de facto wise, yeah, doesn't sit well with me. Because it's not also a wise, it's the stories that are wise. And if, if we're lucky, we can see the wisdom in the stories. And if we're luckier still, we can communicate with authenticity the wisdom of the stories. But the idea that because you're a storyteller, you have this certain kind of wisdom to offer the world, it's just... I don't... Do you, I don't but do you I think don't. you need to embody the wisdom that you're speaking? I just like I'll just can you break that down a bit? Yeah, I will. I will because um, one of the stories you're known for, uh, I think it's from Morocco, is the camel that eats the fruit. The camel driver. The camel yeah. driver. Yeah. And then uh, in it, I don't want to, I don't want to give away any of the plot, but it it's all to do. It's on YouTube. Camel. You can go and watch it, folks. It's on YouTube. <laughs> it's on YouTube. The camel driver. <laughs> But the point, I remember like when I saw that story for the first time and um, a guy comes in and he's willing to give his own life up because he cannot live in a world where someone wouldn't keep his word. Yeah. I remember, and I shook when I heard that. 
and I'm right. like, it shook me. And I was like, could I say the same thing? Do I have that integrity? And I, and I remember thinking, like, could I tell that story? Could I, have, yeah. could I embody that moment? Do you think you have to actually hold the things that you're saying or be influenced by them, by them in some way? I think the thing that made you want to tell the story is what you've got to hold true to. Mm. The sense of wonder about the contents of the story is what you've got to hold to and you've got to be authentic with that and share that sense of wonder. That's what I'm holding true to. I'm holding true to the idea that a man is willing to lay down his life for a complete stranger and then that stranger honors his word. I want to hold true to that, not here's Jan Blake bringing you this story that embodies this kind of deep fundamental wisdom that we all need to know. That's already in the story. What mm. I'm drawn to is like, oh my God, can you believe this guy did that? That's what I'm, that's, that's why I want to tell it. Because I want to share with the audience my sense of flipping heck. There are some <laughs> beautiful people in this world, aren't there? This is possible. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, that's, that's what, you know, or God, we can be, we can be so foolish, can't we? Or, oh my God, I can't believe that just... She turned herself into a buffalo. Can you believe that? You know, that's what I'm bringing. Yeah. And yeah. because I only tell stories that kind of uh, tap into that sense of, oh, are people amazing? Aren't we amazing? Don't we have this amazing potential? Because I'm tapping into that, that's what you're getting. You're getting my sense of, oh, God. And yes, you know, I understand about pacing and I understand about rhythm and I understand about tension and I understand all those things that come within the story, but the story already holds them. You know, I bring my voice to it and I, and I, might, um, I might add my own artistry to it, but it's perfect. Mm. Yeah. Because you said you don't prepare. So I never prepare. I'm lazy. Yeah. I told you. I told you I was lazy. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't. I read a story. I read a story, but it, you know what galvanizes me is the story itself and the moment of telling. Yeah. The moment between me and all those people who I've sang with in the room. That moment is golden. That's where the story lives. It doesn't live before while I'm trying to figure out how to tell it. That's not where it lives. So it lives in that moment between me and the audience. And it, 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 it develops in that moment. So I'm willing to risk a misstep, a, a uh, a word said incorrectly I'm willing to risk forgetting a really important bit of information because in my excitement I'm trying to get to let you understand what's going on I'm willing to risk all of that because in my everyday conversations with people I'm doing that anyway and I want that place where I'm telling stories to be exactly the same um, space that I occupy when I have conversations with my friends when I talk to the taxi driver, when I have a word with the bus driver or, you know, the stewardess or steward on the, on the aeroplane, you know, I want it to be the same thing. I want it to be people engaged in a conversation and things occur to you as you talk, just like we are now, you know, we're speaking to each other and things are occurring to us and we're, you know, we're extemporizing on what, what, what we thought or what was said. And it's the same space for me yeah yeah so so preparation therefore is almost like and again i'm not saying people shouldn't prepare no this is your people way. have to do their thing this is what i believe to prepare the story is to um fear the interaction between me and the 
I want it to be as real and as authentic and as spontaneous as anything. And the thing with me is if, if it's not like that, I don't talk. You know, yeah, you're not going to create it. You're not going to synthetically sort of conjure it up. Like it's, it's got to be real. Yeah, it's got to be real. And when I say I don't talk, I spend a lot of time talking or not talking. And when I'm not talking, it's because it can't be that way. It can't be real. It can't be, it's forced. Or I sense that someone's trying to present something that I'm not sensing is authentic. And then I'm, it's almost like I'm struck dumb. I don't know how to respond. So I can't talk. And so I don't. And it's not a judgment of anyone. It's just, I don't know how to respond to that. It's not, I can sense it's not real. They want something from me and I don't, it's not, it's not an equal exchange. Something is wanted and I don't know how to give it. And so, uh. Yeah, I think that's really big at the moment because, um, you know, storytelling is a thing and, and people kind of like, oh, tell us the wisdom of storytelling. Tell us, tell us about, uh, you know, tell us, which is why I wanted to hang out with storytellers. You know what I mean? As opposed to just like, what would the storyteller say about this? Because we do have a funny way of, um, I don't know, witnessing the heart or like, just like listening a bit, just sort of stepping out the way a bit, you know, letting things come up. Uh, what I'm finding interesting about the, story, the storytelling movement, community, whatever you want to call it, um, is that people are approaching it from the outside in. Mm. So people are thinking, right, I want, to, I want to do something. I want to create a space. And I know you've just said this and it's not an attack. It's just, it's just very interesting to me. There's a lot of people coming at storytelling like, right, so I want to create a space. I want to create an, an opportunity. But no one's thinking about repertoire. No one's talking about material. No one's talking about diving into the stories themselves. They're always talking about how they can use story to do something. Yeah. But what about the actual stuff, the material, the stories themselves? You know, how many people are delving for hours, just going, turning the page, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Oh, this is the one I've got to tell. You know, how many people are really connecting with the meat of it all? You know? Mm. And, and, and it's something I, I'm, I don't quite understand it because... Maybe it's because of the way I came into it. You know, I came into it totally unaware of it. I didn't even know what it was. And I started and immediately someone said, you've got to do this for the rest of your life. And I went, okay. But what the thing to do was to read the stories and tell them, read the stories and tell them, read the stories and tell them, hear the stories and tell them. Not right. So this, I have a tool here. And with this tool, I can make myself visible. So let's use this tool to make myself visible. It wasn't about that. No. It was just like, do you know what I mean? And I think... Yeah, getting to grips with the actual, uh, where well, you've said it, with the content of the story and also your, your natural reactions to it, that it's not... Yeah. This is not the bit that has to sound like something. This is not the bit that has to do this. It's like, this is how I feel. This is how... Yeah. This is what it's doing to me. And I can, yeah. that. I can offer that to you. Yeah. And the people who I love to listen to, it's the same thing for them. You know, mm -hmm. I've been storytelling festivals and there's people who talk about festivals and talk about what their organization talk. And there's people who just sit there and just trade stories back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. Like, oh my God, have you heard this one? Oh my God, have you heard this one? Oh, there's that one. There's a, that is, that is joy to me you know, not an academic, not an academic overview at all. Just, a, just, a, you know, just stories, just tripping off the tongue backwards and forwards. But it's, you know, I don't know how else to explain it other than that. It is a beautiful thing to be engaged with that, you know, and to make, to delight in watching a fellow storyteller's face when you tell them the story that you've just discovered or, that, that their telling has reminded you of. And then for them to watch your face as you listen to them, to, you know, that is just golden. It really, really is. We need more of that, I think. 
Mm. More of that, more of the connection to the actual narrative. Because the rest will happen. Yeah. I suppose we're sort of, you know, we're taught to be strategic and it's kind of we're in the world of the entrepreneur now, where you're sort of, you know, self-made and... I mean, you know, like if you're 21, you're already like 21 year olds on Instagram. They're, they're brilliant at self-branding. They are masters. They've yeah. learned marketing. They're conditioned yeah. to have their own brand and all this stuff. So, yeah. you know, how I sort of want to express myself doesn't match up to, an, you know, these ideas of what a storyteller is meant to be or what it's meant to do or. Mm. Well, a friend uh, said to me, can you tell me a story about <laughs> um, that humanity made a good decision and everything turned out okay? And I was like, I'll tell you what, I'll come back. I'll let you know what story has answered your question. You know? <laughs> why, would anyone, why, why would anyone want that now when it's patently not? I don't get, I don't get why anyone would ask that. I think he just wanted to be, I think he was a bit frightened and he just wanted to be soothed that like, Oh, I see. Like people can make choices for the better. We're at a critical juncture and it has happened that we've made a good decision. Um, the story I did come back to him with was um, about a luck child. And I got this sense like the luck child is any situation he's in turns to his advantage. Yeah. And what's quite lovely about that is it's doing it in a way that you're just kind of talking about is that he walks into a den of robbers. Yes. And uh, there's a woman by the fire says, what are you doing? You're in a den of robbers. They, you know, they're going to yeah. rob you. And he's like, yeah. and he's like, well, I can see why that's a problem, but actually I'm just really tired and I lie down. You know? yeah. And then the robbers discover a letter in his pocket. Yeah. I know the story. Well, yeah. yeah. They discover a letter in his pocket and then they rewrite it. So the king who'd order his death, now they say, like, go and marry the daughter. You know? Yeah. And it's just this, like, relaxed acceptance of what's going on. And he comes out shining every time. Even to the point of meeting the devil. And you've got to add to that, is that his heart is open the whole time. He's yeah. an open-hearted individual. Yeah. You know? And that's why he's got no, there's no side to the luck child other than open heart and purpose. Yeah. That's why it works to his advantage. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what I think anyway. He does that lovely thing of like, he comes to a gatekeeper and he says, well, tell me what you know. He says, well, I know yeah. everything. I know yeah. everything. And he says, well, can you tell us there's a fountain in our, our fountain used to spout wine. Yeah. Now this it's been dry and you know, we're, no, none of us are singing songs. We're just like, we're sad. We want it to flow again. Mm. Well, I can't tell you now, but, you know, give me a couple of months. I just, it's like, you know, that childish kind of thing. I know everything. And I, and I know so much that I know that I don't know it yet. Yeah. It's funny, I've heard, of, I've heard a version where he says, um, uh, they say to you, who are you? And he says, I'm a fool. And they go, ah, oh, a fool who thinks he's a fool can't be such a fool. Ah. Tell us. Why does our fountain not flow? Okay. You know, Daniel Norden, that's his version of the story. Yeah. He says that a fool who, fool who knows he's a fool can't be such a fool. Okay. That's very good. You know? Yeah. But, you know, I think, I think, um, I can't remember how we got onto the look child. Oh, yeah, I was talking about um, talking delving. About Storytellers being put in boxes and things and like being asked to be certain things or say certain things. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's not them being asked. I think it's them asking of themselves. I think, like you say, the entrepreneurial spirit is real. And uh, the, to have the courage or the laziness in my case to say, yeah, I don't want to do that. It's okay. And it's not a cavalier. It's just like, it is okay. I don't, I trust that I'll still be, because there's enough for everybody. 
whatever kind of storyteller they are, no matter how they approach their storytelling, whether they're self-marketing or entrepreneur or whatever, it is enough for all of us. So it's okay for me to do it my way. It's okay. And it's okay for you to do it your way. But, you know, I'm not going to comment. I would never comment on the way anyone approaches telling their story or approaches engaging with storytelling unless they come into my storytelling workshop. Yeah. Then if they're in that space, I reserve the right to say whatever I, I think. Because they've invited you to. Yeah, you, exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, then you don't hold back. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you mean, Simon. <laughs> it's, it's, it's transformative. It's transformative. <laughs> yeah, it's, I don't know. I mean, I know I was really strict with you about uh, when you came with the Taliesin story. I know I was really strict with you about the witch character. No, but that was good. Though. Yeah, because I was using it as a bit of a comedy filler and then you were like, hang on, that is, who is that person? Yeah. Just ask us to look. Like, that was it. It was like, have you looked at that? That was all it was. Yeah. yeah. And I think I was, <laughs> because I'd started going to my herbalist around about that time. Yeah. As well, I started using my herbalist, Roisin Riley, she's a wonderful herbalist to anyone who's listening in the UK, particularly in London. She's a wonderful urban herbalist, little advert there. Say the and, name um, Urban Herbalist. Roisin, Ro, she's called Roisin Riley. Wicked. And you'll find her on Facebook as the Urban Herbalist. So if you're based in London and after the lockdown, you need a good herbalist, I recommend her to you. Very, she very strong. She might be sending people, she might be doing online consultations. She is doing online consultations. There we go. She is. Probably you know. Okay. But anyway, um, I'd started going to her around about the time that I was running that course, that um, masterclass. So I had a completely different take on who these women were. You know, these women who knew the name of every berry and uses of every berry, every bit of bark, every leaf, every flower, every root, you know. I kind of had a complete different spin on it. So, and the idea that this woman was, she was, she was trying her best for her kid, even if she was twisted, even if she was power hungry and twisted, the, the mothering impulse was very strong within her and her, her um, skills and her artistry as someone who could use all those herbs to make a, a potent, uh, elixir was very very real for me at that time yeah so and that's why I was just like wait a minute and also knowing that it was those women who were kind of during the reign of James the first so horribly tortured and killed for their ability to do all of that it was all it all just came together in that moment and no, I brilliant. saw it a different but then it, but like the whole point of it is is that you've given me you gave me a bigger possibility, right? So it's like then suddenly Keridwin becomes fuller and there are more dimensions to her. You can yeah. get your arms around her. Yes. Feel her more. Um, well, it was always my thing uh, where it's like, if I was unsure, you know that bit where you can kind of, I would like tremble and there was a chance to actually go di into a deeper experience with the story. Yeah. I would sort of, keep very clever and sort of try and pop in a little liner because I was unsure so I sort of buy time with like throwing something in yeah and you're like no 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 <laughs> like, that's, that's not what this story right there needs you know yeah and that's what I love I love uh, I love being a student and I love um you know how the hell should I know everything I don't I, I love yeah. storytelling and I've got instincts for it but yeah. I love, you know, you've been storytelling for, you know, for 25 years. Me? And 34, try 34. 34. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and to have that intuition and that sensitivity and that quality, you know, it just builds me up, you know. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know how, you know, there's a little bit of anti-teacher in a few things. And I think um, it's been the best experiences of my life of actually to meet a real teacher and have them just and be open. And let that person mm. see me and um, hopefully take on board what they've said. Yeah. The other thing that was 
good for me doing that masterclass and, and subsequently doing the masterclass, which has now moved to a five metre bell tent in my back garden. Yeah. And um, because actually what I discovered, well, there's two things. First of all, I was discovering what I knew as much as sharing with you what I knew during that masterclass. And the second thing that I discovered was I found that there was a lot of anxiety around, maybe because of the setting, maybe because we were doing it in a theatre space. You know, not everybody was at peace with where we were, I think. And I think, do you know what I mean? Well, I just, for me, I just, if you, <laughs> for me, a workshop space is more intimidating than a theatre with 100 people. Like then, right. you know, you talk like, I remember once being in a trio of people and just the rehearsals, I was just going through the motions. I couldn't bring it, you know. And then suddenly we got to the performances and they were like, oh, you, you're actually, you know, you're not bad at this. And I was like, yeah, but that, the story's not there, you know. The rehearsal, yeah. I'm just like, oh, what, so we're going to do this at this point? You know? Yeah. And, I and then when they show me a hundred people and I'm just like, oh, yeah, you know, this is kind of yeah. the easy bit. But yeah. The big thing. But the intensity of the workshop helps you go over stuff in a way you wouldn't otherwise. And then you kind of. You know, you find another yeah. in, the, in the performance. But I think the environment, after that master, master class, I decided that I had to change, completely change the environment in which I taught the master class. Yeah. So even though I've got, you know, my garden isn't big, but it can hold a five metre bell tent. So that's when I decided, okay, I've got to create a more um, holistic space in which to teach these workshops. So I'm uh, gonna do it in the back garden, I'm gonna do it in the tent. Um, so and I'm gonna cook for everybody. Yeah. So, so lunch time, you know, cook lunch, a vegetarian lunch for everyone, you know, and we're just gonna, again, it's that thing of, instead of kind of pushing along, we've got four weeks, four one week modules, and we're gonna push, push, push. We're gonna, we've got four one week modules. And we're just going to take as much time as we need to explore. And if at the end of this, you want to get up and tell a story, let's go for it. If you don't, that's fine. You know, that's the way I've approached it. And, and you know, friends would come on the Fridays. Friends would come, we'd do a barbecue and people would just come and those in the tent, do you want to tell a story? My friends are here, would you like to tell them a story? And they would, and it would just be so different. Beautiful. so different well that that's what i want to do with the um these beautiful spaces in in utrecht is that sense of yeah so just take the performance out about how do you share a story yeah how are you in that you know in grandmother's fireside you know that yeah. sense of just someone on a friday would just start to tumble out a story yeah um and they've like the, the people who are curating the spaces, they're like, yeah, but don't you want a performance to add pressure to that moment? And I'm like, I'm not, I don't know yet if I do or not. I'd mm. rather have, yeah, that sense of that it's carried in you and it's formed in you and it's germinated you. And it's just part of you now. It's woven into mm. you. And I wouldn't want that intimacy compromised by the sense of like, oh, in six weeks, it's showtime. You know? Yeah. I find out. I don't know yet. Jan, are we going to, let's draw this to a close. It's just lovely. Thank you for making time. Oh, it's my I've pleasure. Had a ball. I hope, uh, I hope uh, other people who've watched this have had a ball. Um, yeah, me too. Are they watching now? Are you li are watching live? No, I didn't get that sorted. A future right. edition might have that. Um, oh, yeah. When's your next um, body of words thing? Well, it would have been this year. Uh, so it will be happening next year, April, May, June, July. That's okay. for one week modules during that time in my little tent, in my little garden. Do you want to, in the tent, and anyone, people can step in for either the four or for one module? Can't well, I, it's four or two, I would say. One, it doesn't really, I mean, it is great for the person, but it's not great for the group. Yeah. Because one of the other thing that happened with putting it in the tent is this sense of cohesion amongst all the tellers. Yeah. yeah. You know, and we became 
for those of us, particularly 2018, you know, it was just like a little community of tellers who got together once a month for four, four for uh, a week and shared and ate and laughed. You know, that's, that's more what I'm, I'm heading towards, you know, and give me, and, the, and they gave me the opportunity to help them de develop a deeper connection with the stories they chose to bring. You know, that's for me is where it's at. Yeah, I'll definitely be back. Oh yeah, um, you're welcome. Yeah, I'd love it. I'd love it. Um, we've got a little plan, haven't we? Yes, we have. When is our plan for October? Yeah, the first yeah. Saturday. I think it's the third. Right. And the idea is, you're going to come, and it's not just for storytellers. No, it's it's well. I'll leave that side to you. But from my point of view. Um, paraphrasing because I didn't, um, I haven't got to hand what we decided on, but it's basically one of the things that I have been interested in, especially um, over, I'd say from summer last year, you know, there's a lot of movements, there's a lot of, um, you know, activism, people want to say, they want to share their their manifesto or their story or their their view of things and it's not just one person it's a collective of people and it's like okay so how do you communicate your message um how do you get a, how do you take yourself out of the way of the message that you're trying to communicate so i'm going to look at um, using folk tales, obviously, because that's that is what I use um, to look at how you tell collectively. How do you create one voice? You know, how does a group of people speak as though there's one voice? And how do you communicate that story um, with the same heart and authenticity with a number of voices, but that it sounds like one voice? And what yes. are the obstacles to, to getting that out there? Yeah, so, like, so how do you, when you're put in that situation, how do you habitually respond? Like, we all have our habitual ways of, like, you know, yes. environment. And yeah. then through being with a story, that just becomes transparent, what your habits are. Yeah. And then gives you a chance to become aware of your kind of habits and also have this amazing sense of kind of holding something in a... In yeah, a exactly. So. Thank you. Very well put. I'm not always... Um, I'm, I'm not always articulate. <laughs> no, you are, you so are. You're I just, you know, just like that's another part of it. Yeah, that I, um, yeah. that I sense. So I can't wait for that. And I'm really happy yeah. to come over. Yeah, it would be great. Thanks so much for the conversation. As I say, I'm, I'm taking away with me, yeah, that sense of um, what you said about the wonder. Is that the job of a storyteller is to yeah but be sensitive to where your wonder is and where your joy is mm. not be the person who knows stuff or you know is that but is just able to be impressed and to love it yeah That's and it. also to not force to not approach it from the outside in you know the yeah, you know like material. yeah you know the the um there's that quote it's from, I first heard it from a Bob Marley song. The stone that the builder refused becomes the head cornerstone. Oh. Yeah. But to me, that cornerstone is the story. The cornerstone of the building is the story. It's not the building. It's not the space. It's the story. Mm. Everything should be built from that. Not the building, then the story. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I was just like working like, how would that, would that make sense to a non-storyteller? And let's just leave it as that, you know, like what is it? I suppose it's like the real material, like where's your art? I think that's what yeah. people are finding out now, like where is your, your soul calling? I had this lovely, um, do you know Manly P. Hall? Have you ever heard of him? No. 
He's this esoteric, I've only just heard of him, and then someone said I had to read his book. And it's called this. It's called The Secret Teachings of All Ages. Ooh. And he wrote it when he was 27. Right. And it's that big. And right. there's also hundreds of hours of this guy giving lectures online. And he says, well, if, if you look at all the traditions, all the mystery schools, the kind of... Um, the rites of passage that were happening in Greece, the kind of things that Plato got his ideas from. He articulated things that these guys were holding. Um, they all point to these, the, there are these consist consistencies. And he's got this amazing gift for Precy, so he just writes a paragraph and like, that is what they believed. And you kind of right. feel it. He's amazing. Um, but he had this, uh, this thing online called Finding Your True Purpose. Right. right. And he's got this other lovely thing is that he's got this old world way of talking. So he's sort of, he was, you know, he, this book came out in the 1920s. He was giving a lecture in the 1950s where like when you're saying something is that is because how it is. I'm not, mm. it's not open to interpretation. I've learned it. This is how it is, you know? And mm. he says, man, he talks about, he doesn't say about people. He talks about man. Yeah. That's the age. Yeah. Man is, restless because he doesn't know his true purpose and he doesn't know that he's here to unfold beauty mm. yeah. Love that. and we've all got to, i think we've got to find that for ourselves now like where is what's that thing where you're unthinking that the beauty bubbles up so yeah. you can't design that you can't plan that in that no. happens when you're not planning. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. What's the quote again? Man is restless because Man is he doesn't restless understand. Because he doesn't understand where his, uh, what his purpose is, what he's here to do. Which he's, is here to, he's here to unfold beauty. Yeah. yeah. Sounds like the title of a book. Unfolding beauty. Unfolding beauty. Well, let's talk about that another time. We will. We will. All right. I'm going to um, depress record. But okay. I'm chatting. Thanks yeah. very much, Simon. Happy for the opportunity. <laughs> it's been great. <laughs> bye bye. Okay. Bye.